Welcome everyone. My name is Yara Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are so excited to be here with all of you to welcome Levon Braves in conversation with Inse Ufa, a brave discussion of sensual faith. It is an invitation for women to discover a healthier approach to spirituality and sexuality that centers pleasure rather than shame for body and sex positive preacher and author of On Grace. So I want to first introduce our uh, moderator tonight. Inse Ufu is the founder of New South Super PAC and founding chief executive found officer of the New Georgia Project, a nonpartisan civic engagement nonprofit organization started by leader Stacey Abrams. Under her leadership, New Georgia Project has helped nearly 700,000 Georgians. Each year, New Georgia Project organizers and volunteers have millions of high quality face to face conversations with young Georgians, Georgians of color, women, and femmes. Their organizing efforts combined with producing popular mobile video games, the bold and aggressive political research agenda she leads, and the smart ways in which they leverage culture and cultural organizing has led to a historic increase in voter participation and earned New Georgia Project credit for flipping Georgia in the 2020 presidential election <laughs> and helping Georgia elect its first African-American and first Jewish United States Senate. So thank you for your work and time. Uh -huh. Thank you for your time tonight. We're very honored to have you with us. Yeah. Very grateful to the New Georgia Project for all the shots. And the woman of the hour tonight is Alana Briggs, the Emmy Award winner she is a body and sex positive womanist preacher, speaker, coach, and creator. Briggs is the host of the Sensual Faith podcast, the founder of Beautiful Scars, a healing centered storytelling agency focused on fostering pleasure and resiliency. Visionary of the proverbial experience and curator of Sensual Faith Sunday, a, a series of virtual spiritual gatherings to nourish your soul. She's been featured in Essence, Cosmopolitan, Rolling Stone, and Washington Post, as well as and Sojourners named for one of 11 women shaping the church. A New York City native and proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, the Long Braves is, is, is currently based in New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> so um, for all our folks virtually and for everybody in the room, guys, please give it up for uh, our esteemed speakers this evening and we want to say feel free to if you're watching virtually put questions in the chat and if you're here in person with us i'll bring a mic around um, when we get to that part but for now um i'm going to pass it over to you and say thank you so much for being here Um, I am so, 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 so happy uh, to be doing this, to be here with mm -hmm. you. Uh, the launch of this project, <sighs> Sensual Faith. Um, so we were doing a little forensic, relationship forensics uh, mm -hmm. before we, when we sat down and figured out like when we mm -hmm. were initially introduced and we were introduced by a former colleague um, who is an organizer, but also a faith leader. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, ah, you know, I bet this pastor, she's super dope. You have to meet her. She's a woman this pastor. She's also a scholar and she's super cool. And, she fly. Hey. and he's like, and y'all would be, you would hit it off. And, and, I was like, and he was absolutely correct. <laughs> Um, and so I feel like I have, like many of your followers, um, have had the, the wonderful uh, pleasure of following the journey. Um, sensual faith feels like absolutely an extension of your scholarship, the things that you make us laugh about and think about on TikTok yeah. right? and follow her. She's a good time, y'all. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm cutting you off, but I want you to know that people are always like, oh, you're so brilliant, you're so beautiful. And I'm like, yes, I am. That's great. <laughs> when you tell me I'm funny, that's like my favorite compliment, and it just makes me happy. My purpose is <laughs> fulfilled. <laughs> so thank you. Me. Thank you for seeing me. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Okay. So it is here. Yes. Talk to us about sensual faith, this offering, this yes. gift yes. Um, that you have given to us. 
that's what it is, child. You know, I honor that in my belief system, we believe that before you break the time and space continuum, you say yes to your journey <laughs> and to your path. And so I had a soul contract around sensual state, which means that I needed to live through everything and survive through it, thrive on the other side of everything that will allow me to talk about a framework for Black women and fans and those that support us, where we live our spirituality from a place of pleasure rather than shame. Because for uh, first generation Caribbean American, <laughs> shout out to Tony, mm -hmm. who was born and raised in the church and experienced different denominations, it didn't matter what the label was on the outside of the building, the messaging around my body was clear that it is bad, evil, something to be tamed, repressed, and shamed, which means that everything attached to my body, which is odd because I was 5'8 in the sixth grade, I've always been noticeable, right, in these spaces. But then when you come up against this matrix of systems of oppression, it's like, now you try to make me invisible, but you can't because I'm literally tall as shit, right? Can I cuss on this? I, <laughs> I you did already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. Are you going to ask that before we start? Before yeah. all this. Okay. <laughs> right. And so. That's going to take my race. Right. Yeah, if, if, if it was going to be a problem. Okay. Actually, what are we doing here? Um, and so my faith has always been an integral part of my journey. And as I became a girl and a young adult, and now I'm a grown woman, I can do whatever I want. Thank you, Beyonce. Um, I wanted a spiritual belief system that centered me and affirmed me and celebrated me and brought me closer to the divine rather than distancing me from the divine. So that's really the life journey story. <laughs> I love this. Um, one of the things that I found so wonderful about sensual faith, um, in addition to just how clearly you make like your analysis, mm. like how plain it is. Make and, plain preacher. Plain. <laughs> and like I just I was uh, uh, um, absorbing and digesting um, sort of the the reflections mm. um, that you offered or invited us to sort of consider, um, but as well as the celebrations. Yeah. Um, and there is a thread, and it's a soft thread, there's several, mm. but around like acknowledgement and celebration of your body mm. um, and sensuality and sexuality. And the thing that immediately my I started to respond to was the teaching that um, we are inherently sinful, mm. that like by nature, and that is why we need Ooh. salvation. Mercy. But that's my teaching. It wasn't. Yeah. It, it, I don't even know where it came from. I knew. Were you, were you raised in the church? I was raised in the church. Um, I'm also an immigrant. I'm Nigerian, and I'm Nigerian. 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 Yeah. Let me tell you, <laughs> Africans know how to do other people's <laughs> religions. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. And I have a story. I'm going to get to your question. But when I studied in East Africa, when I was at Yale Divinity School, I remember meeting my colleagues at Uganda Christian University, and their theology was very steep in atonement, which is about blood and punishment and redemption for that. And my white colleagues were like, you know, it's just so violent. And I was like, first of all, what do you think came through the continent with this violent theology? There were no black liberation or womanist theologians coming through being like, actually, y'all, oh, that's really colonized. Let's liberate us. Right? So, first of all, I get it. So, I'm just honoring that, you know, even on the continent, it's a, there's another layer of colonialism and imperialism. That's Woo! But yeah, the guy, did you finish your thought? Well, it's just the idea that we are by very, our very nature mm -hmm. as humans. Yeah. Sinful, the born of sin, yeah, right? mm -hmm. um, and a reflection of like, and, and it is why we need salvation, it's why right. we need the savior because of our inherent bad yeah. and evilness. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think that it has ever um, been challenged, mm -hmm. right? Like, and so <laughs> the idea that there's a framework and a way to think about myself as divine yeah. and the, not only the divine in me but yeah. that my body is divine yeah. it just feels it blew my mind <laughs> the doors off yeah. of my mind and I was like okay so 
where does it come from? Mm-hmm. Right? Obviously, like years mm-hmm. of study, yeah. but what in your life like led you on this journey? What was the emphasis? Do you remember? Yeah, that's a really good question. The the amusing part of my journey is that I have always been on it, even if I wasn't aware of it. Mm-hmm. So growing up, yes, everybody in the church is Caribbean, right? And we had a white Jesus on the cross. <laughs> but like when an elder transitioned, we would have a nine night service. Like on the ninth night after they transitioned, we believe that's when the soul went back to the ancestral realm. So we're having a party and we're put, putting a plate out. And, you know, I was performing libation like activities without mm-hmm. calling it libation. So the African retention was always there. It was just, my mom's from Barbados, my dad's from Guyana, <laughs> British colonialism and imperialism. The hell of a drug. <laughs> right? So it was there, but that's the beautiful part about being African descended people is that even when you're not conscious like of what's happening, it's still happening. That's just how grand spirit is. And so I went on the journey to do a few things. Um, beloved Dr. Crystal Jones is here, taught me this language about decolonizing one's Christianity. Um, And Dr. Jones says that we can say decolonize or we can say liberate. It means the same thing. When you say decolonize, it's centering colonization. When you say liberate, it's centering liberation. So I liberated my Christianity when I found out that Jesus was, in the words of (laughs) Reverend Matt King Carter, a nigga from Nazareth. (laughs) When I discovered that Jesus was Black and Native African, I was like, what does that mean for me? Um, So then I started understanding, well, my ancestors knew God before the colonizers brought their white people. So what were my ancestral practices like? Um, And that revelation was like, when I saw an African woman's body portrayed in art for the first time, I was like, that's my body, right? And I was like, oh shit, like there are women shaped like me? Because growing up in the West, in America, you just see like these thin, real white bodies and it's like, that couldn't be further from me, right? Unless you were a white man. And so to see the beauty and the divinity in that, helped me to deconstruct what Dr. Christina Cleveland calls the white male God. Mm-hmm. This idea that God is only portrayed as white, old, male, white beard, right? And the last part was learning to love myself unapologetically, which we are not habituated to do in churches. Um, I, I felt in my body that the teachings I received as a child were insufficient for me. And to close the loop on the question, I grew up thinking that sin was this legalized list of do's and don'ts. Actually, I didn't even grow up with that. I got that when I was a young adult and I was attending a Pentecostal church. Let me be real, real. Sin wasn't really a thing. (laughs) Sin wasn't really a conversation in the Episcopal church, except we like prayed like a prayer of like forgiveness or whatever. But when I learned that sin is separation from God, that sin is separation from the divine, I was like, oh, so what causes me to feel far from my creator? That's the sin. It's not, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't have sex, I'm holy. And so I started to honor that anything that separates me from feeling close to my creator, that is the sin. And when we look in the Bible, when we see the word salvation, it's not about rescuing you from your depraved, sinful state. Salvation actually means healing. So when you see that in the text, what must I do to be saved is read as what must I do to be healed, right? You okay. see how that, right? that's yes. so much inherently living to even the breath you just took. Absolutely. That is sensual faith, that feeling of I'm in my body. Good. God loves me. My community loves me. I love me. That is what I started to pull towards. And I'm bringing y'all on the journey with me in the book. <laughs> I love this, and um, there are definitely times when I get accused of being like semantics at this time. Okay. But words do matter. Words mean things. Words absolutely mean things. And so just how freeing understanding the like actual definition of salvation and mm-hmm. what the messages that it was intended right. to communicate to us uh, feels really important, which also on the flip side of that, makes me feel like the absence of Mm -hmm. particular language Mm -hmm. also feels pretty harmful. Mm -hmm. And you make the argument like kind of intentional. Um, So specifically, there was definitely an anecdote about a pastor refusing to say the word (laughs) when talking about circumcision, even though there's literally no other part of the the body. I could not bring him to say the word. And then we blame it on the children. Mm-hmm. Right, right. There's children present, so we can't say things. But 
it was in a separate part, but just the idea that you don't have a JJ, you right. don't have a hoo-ha. You don't? And that, listen, 30% of American women are able to do, um, sort of identify, identify all the parts of their yoni, vaginal area, genitalia, yeah. <laughs> it's three out of ten. That's a lot. And it feels intentional. Like, it's not a lot of women. I'm saying, like, that's extra. The fact that only three out of ten of American women can be like, this is labia, right? Labia, <laughs> manure, mature, right. vulva, right? right? Like, they can identify their fallopian tubes. Mm-hmm. It feels like such a <laughs> drama. <laughs> right. It feels so criminal. It feels it so is. intentional. It is. Um, it, you know, you will talk later about how purity culture is purity culture is a scam. Yeah. Right. But it all feels like just the the notion of how we are to think about women. And mm-hmm. women's bodies mm-hmm. feels like a scam. Yeah. And when I was all the way in was when you gave us the anecdote about Mary and mm-hmm. how we need to think about black women's bodies and the story around that. And um, I'm just I'm wondering if you would share with yeah, us. Please. Absolutely. So when I was in undergrad. I underwent a very radical religious conversion experience. Having grown up in the Episcopal Church, it was very sit stand meal, right? And then I go to this Pentecostal church, and if you're familiar with Pentecostalism, it's very demonstrative and loud, and people ah, speak in tongues and roll around the floor and swinging from chandeliers, right? So, <laughs> right. So the first time I was at the service, I was like, what is going on? But eventually I came around because I'm a very embodied person. Um, and I bring that up because it was a a launch pad for me to think about how my body shows up in churches and how it is viewed when it's acceptable to be seen and when it's not, right? So when I walk in, I shouldn't have on a body con, have on a long skirt, right? But if I'm like shouting in the spirit, okay, that movement is okay. Oh, unless you got on a low cut top, then we need to put a handkerchief, right? So like people were policing my body even in worship when it was supposed to be a liberative experience. So for me... I was like, we are in these spaces that police women's bodies and throwing God or Jesus or other language on top of it. And we are missing one of the key bodies in the text, which often some churches, I don't say all churches, some churches are very focused on the torture and murder of Jesus, right? The Christ figure. And I'm like, you talk more about that than you do the life, the ministry, and the resurrection. Like, why are we so committed to this violent narrative? When the truth of the matter is, Mary (laughs) carried Jesus, so he came from somewhere. Mary was not a 40-year-old white woman, as the Catholic Church would have you to believe. Mary was a 13-year-old black girl. And so what does that mean that in this scripture that many churches read during, like, the Christmas season, Mary consented. She says, let it be done unto me as you will. A 13-year-old Black girl consented with the divine to say, let's go have one baby, basically, right? (laughs) That's the way they want us to believe it. Because if we were to consider another narrative Mm -hmm. that how you get pregnant is via sex, we would have to admit that Mary had sex and we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just say, presupposing what you've been teaching me is true, that means a man, a biological man, had nothing to do with the creation of Christ. It was a 13-year-old Black girl, the spirit of the creator, And that means that Mary's womb, (laughs) Mary's blood, and Mary's ashayness, her energy, was infused into Christ. So the blood of Jesus is really the blood of Mary. And this is theology that some people are not ready for or don't want to engage because it forces you to think and ask questions. And I believe that a thinking person of faith is a blessed person of faith. I love this. <laughs> I love this. Uh, my mom has a story. My family, um, my grandfather, is credited as um, bringing the Lutheran Church to Nigeria. Okay. We're gonna, okay. Um, we're gonna unpack that <laughs> okay. uh, on another episode of <laughs> right. Sexual Faith. Um, but um, she got kicked out of the Lutheran school for asking. To um, and so the idea that your expression of your faith or your 
that you're sort of testing and flexing your faith is built on a practice of mm-hmm. asking questions. Yeah. And then there's a story about your F training. Yes, I knew that's where you were going. 100 percent Um Queens Girl. Hey. Right? Hey. Yeah. It's so funny because I have 100 percent claimed you could put south. <laughs> like, so, New Orleans, Atlanta, in my mind, like, okay, obviously. At one point, I self-identified as a Northern Belle by way of the Bay Area. <laughs> because, you know, New York, Connecticut, Jersey, Atlanta, Oakland, Atlanta. You get around. You're on the side. People are like, how do you move across the country? I'm like, you pack up your shit, you can ship your car, you buy your ticket, and you go. But that, that, that's another anecdote that we can get to later, but I have a gift where I make our things look easy. Mm-hmm. It's just what I do. Like my mom <laughs> was born on Barbados where children were to be seen and not heard. And mm-hmm. so when she raised me and my brother, she vowed never to silence us. So one day we were going to preschool and she would drive me on the preschool and go to work. But it's like six o'clock in the morning, y'all. You know, if you've been to New York City, then you know how people can be on the subway. They're just at 6 a.m. At 6 a.m. <laughs> they are, are like pre caffeinated. <laughs> they don't want to deal with other shenanigans. And so I was talking to my mom. She kept asking me, what else? What else? So I'm still talking, going on to figure out new things to say. And then looking at her like, will you please shut this little girl up? And so here we are, <laughs> almost 40 years later, and I'm still asking, what else? What else? Why? Who? Where? When? Like, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? I love so, that. Yeah. Do you find that your um, consistency in the consistency of your inquiry mm-hmm. is supported or celebrated uh, amongst your religious colleagues? Child. So I identify as nosy. It is nice. <laughs> I know myself. Okay. Um, and I also know that vulnerability is my superpower. So it actually feels awkward to not mm-hmm. share. And I'm not talking about oversharing because there was a point in my life where I was, you know, living from a wound and oversharing as a way to be seen. Mm-hmm. But now it's like I've encountered so many black women and femmes. I know my stories, my family stories. Now that I practice ancestral veneration, I have stories from my lineage. So I'm just like, I'm not the only one who went through these things. Because y'all, all my business is in this book, okay? By the time you get to the last I'm like, golly, like, really, bro? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and so to answer your question, um, a lot of the information that I'm sharing is not new. I'm just sharing it in my voice so that it will resonate with the people. Because when you look at Black churches, they're at least 85% Black women. But when you look at Black church leadership, it is not 85% Black women. And so you have to think, in the words of queer theologians and West, who does it serve for me to believe a thing this way? So if I believe that my body is evil, if I believe that I need to serve the church until God sends my husband, if I believe that I'm not supposed to experience pleasure, even though our bodies are divinely designed to experience pleasure. Right, then I'm at war with my body, and that's keeping me from identifying patriarchy, sexism, homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia, all the things in the church. So, straight black male pastors supporting the work of liberating black women and femmes and queer folks and the people who support us that's gonna take away from their bottom line, Mm -hmm. that's gonna take away from their tithes and offering. I'm telling black women. Do not tie to churches that don't ordain you. So you're literally messing with the church. I'm messing money. with the church's <laughs> money. They don't like that. No. I'm a pastor who doesn't go to church, right? My church is here, rise, we do online things and things like that. I tithe, right? I give my dollars to the church or to black women because you can tie to creators and you know people who inspire you and stuff like that. But that's also very challenging. So to answer your question. Um, there are people who are ready to receive it, and this is why I bypassed the church and the academy and was my authentic self and went with the book and publishing because I wanted to get it to the women whose pastors would never address those concerns. I love it so much. You describe yourself as desiring to lead a movement. Yes. Right? Um, yes. Bringing women back to their bodies mm-hmm. um, and the divinity of their bodies. and. The other gift that reading this book gave me was, you know, I don't think I recognized it or identified it before, but I softly 
merged sensuality and uh, sexuality oh, as kind of like yep, the same thing. The same thing. Yep. And with them, right. they're so not like at all. Um, and I'm curious, like, let's stay with sensuality yes. for a second. Um, there's so many gems. <laughs> yeah, <there's> so <laughs> many gems. But and again, the sort of the offer of you know celebrations yeah. and ways to think about sensuality. But what are we what are what is current Christian doctrine missing with respect mm. to um, or like I mean obviously there's not like unified Christian doctrine but what's mainstream yeah. Christianity have to say <laughs> about sexuality and what are the gaps that you've identified? Yeah, so I like to use the language of colonized Christianity, colonized right? Because Christianity. when <laughs> I'm talking about Christianity, I'm talking about the black people. The African ones, right? <laughs> and what did he do to the point where he was so committed to the liberation of his people that he was willing to give up his life for it? I don't believe that Jesus needed to go the way that he went, right? I believe that was state sanctioned murder and violence. So when you have the the religious belief system set up around that framework, it's very different from someone who came to save you specifically from your sins, right? So Religion is from the Latin legate, which means to fasten or to bind. And we learned in elementary school that re means to do something again. And so your religion should be fasten or rebind you to God, right? We think religion is, oh, I got to go to church and I got to do this and X, Y, and Z. So when I think about faith, because uh, I know some people can be turned off by that word because of harm caused <laughs> by Christians in the name of God, um, that faith is what you say you believe, right? So you can have faith in a number of things, faith in science, astrology, astronomy, geology, whatever. Um, spirituality is how you live out that faith. You say you believe this thing, how do you practice it in your day to day? And there is this word ritual within the word spirituality, which means that if you don't have ritual, you're not practicing spirituality, beloved. So it gives you some ritual. I say that sensuality is a womanist spiritual practice. Um, full of rituals, right, that center our body. So, for instance, when you look into the dictionaries, sometimes they'll describe sensuality as being lascivious or lewd. Mm -hmm. I describe sensuality as being the ultimate practice in mindfulness. So, we're all sitting here. It could be, <sighs> have I eaten? Am I hydrated? Did I take my meds? Do I need a nap? Do I need to call my person? Do I need to rub one out? What do I need <laughs> in this moment? And that is not something that Black women and fans have been conditioned to do. We have been taught to run, 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 go, 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 serve, 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 for everybody and their mama first, to the point where you don't even know what it is that turns you on. And we have a culture that is hyper-repressed and hypersexual at the same time. So any language around pleasure has been seen which to close out the definitions, is anything that's going on with your loins and your genitalia, right? right? So that's why sensuality and sexuality are not the same thing. They inform each other, but they're not the same thing. And so when we are raised in traditions that condemn our bodies, even though our bodies are divinely designed to react to stimuli or to, you know, enjoy a nice hot, hot cup of tea, like we have different levels of ability, but if you can see, taste, touch, feel, then that means that you experience the world in a very textured way. And I believe similarly, we also have spiritual gifts of sight and hearing and feeling and things like that. So it's all interconnected. It's really just about having a liberated viewpoint of integration so that we can feel whole ourselves. Um, this makes me think about another passage. Um, and you don't know my book, girl. I know, but it's, I mean, listen. <laughs> I was interview, they don't read it. I was convinced. You can read the title. You, feel. Like you just read the <laughs> comments. That's I was <laughs> you talk so fluently about intuition. Ah. Um, and the idea that, like, the body knows mm -hmm. and that there are just ways of knowing yep. even if it's not formulated into like right. a solid thought or an idea yeah. and part of me feels like one of the hurdles to me personally accessing um, my intuition is one sometimes like courage and fear mm -hmm. right like yeah. I there are things I like to know yeah 
right? Um, and so, you know, trusting that I know there's like a process, but it also feels like it's tied to the misinformation about sensuality and that mm-hmm. if I had, or as I experience more integration, mm-hmm of my senses Mm -hmm. and if I'm more mindful Mm -hmm. that it fosters the kind of trust in yourself and trust in your body that would make intuition work for me. Yeah. Um, This is why I feel like your book is such a gift because having that conversation directly with Black women, Mm -hmm. again, knowing that the societal demands Mm -hmm. of you it takes it it removes the church as an intermediary Mm -hmm. right because I can't imagine I know I'm an organizer yeah yeah, yeah, a campaign strategist yep and so if you bring me this knowledge I want it my initial instinct is how how Mm -hmm. do I make it real I can't imagine how to bring this practice and this understanding within the modern church context Mm -hmm. But I can see how you are leading this movement and talking to Black women directly, right? Um, do you see a way for decolonized Christians or folks who are in, who are committed to a liberatory yeah. Christian Christianity? Do you see them bringing these mindfulness practices into the church setting Mm -hmm. today? And like how? If there's someone listening and watching the stream, and you're like, I don't want to be a trash pastor. (laughs) I don't want to be a pastor (laughs) that like (laughs) right. right, right. (laughs) How would you coach them, counsel them, talk them through bringing those practices into the church house? That's good. I mean, when I think of the profile of the person that you're talking about, I'm probably talking to a Black male pastor. And so he would have to be doing some very holistic healing around his identity as a man and a Black man, particularly a Black religious man in a tradition that sees the Black male figure as like basically God, right? Um, Like my pastor says, and you take that as Bible, you know? So there has to be... (laughs) Um, you know, bell hooks would say we gotta reject patriarchy and power <laughs> and domination because a lot of the teachings that we receive about our bodies are essentially about controlling us. That's all it's about. And you have to know that you don't need to dominate people in order to love them. You can't. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. So it would have to be a relinquishment of power. It would have to be honest dialogue about scripture and Christian tradition um, that has been standing for a very long time. Um, but if, if we're honest, or if you're honest, brother pastor, <laughs> um, you learn a lot of this in seminary. But feelings of oh, I can't teach this in my church, or what's going to happen when I say this? Just say, tell the truth, yeah. right? In loving ways, in um, compassionate ways, in ways where I don't know is seen as a valid answer, right? You don't always have to be like, no, well, the Bible says, child. You you write a letter, right, and send it across the world, and it end up in the Atlantic Ocean for a couple of days, and some of the words dissolve, and then somebody finds it. Like, just think about in a modern context what that means and how we got the Bible. So it tells me that our stories are important, but it also tells me that we don't have the whole story. Right? Come on, serious. That was good. So there are no first person narratives of children in the Bible. There's a first person narrative, which this might be new information to some of you, of uh, women in the Bible, because uh, Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, that book, a lot of people say that Song of Solomon wrote it, but if you actually read it, <laughs> it's talking about my breasts and my bosom are heat. Mm-hmm. So unless Solomon had uh, <laughs> breast augmentation, right? Mm-hmm. That is a woman's point of view. And so even honoring that, oh, wow, an African woman was talking about desire in the Bible, that Song of Solomon has nothing to do with Jesus in the church, okay? Mm-hmm. This is two people, grown, consenting adults engaging in premarital, ethical, consensual, pleasurable sex. I was about to talk about it. L- listen, <laughs> that, when, when have you heard that sermon? When have you heard that sermon from my over right? <laughs> Who's having that conversation? I would definitely (laughs) stop passing notes. I would definitely like. Here's what I heard. Like, hundred percent. It was like, what we talking about? Yeah, we are. So just be honest, right? Have multi generational conversations about body.
embodies in the Bible and truth, right? And then the last part would be to just honor the fact that God is big enough for our questions mm -hmm. and that questions don't lead us away from faith. In fact, it deepens faith. That's why I have a book called Sensual Faith, like questioning all of this and deconstructing, decolonizing, liberating. It didn't make me faithless. It made me faithful, but in a way that feels good to me. It makes you feel good. It should. Um, and social sex. And social sex. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like, black Christians are having sex, they're just not talking about it. And Ooh. you mentioned purity culture er earlier. So if you hear every Sunday, if you have sex before marriage, you're going to hell, and holiness are hell, and you got to keep your legs closed. Boys and men, we're not getting purity culture, true love weights, pinky promise bullshit, right? Like pledges no, no. and certificates. No, no, no. Right? No, no, no. So you have these boys not getting the teaching, girls getting the teaching. We grow up, we encounter each other. Now we're fueling, this is a content warning for assault, assault culture, because they didn't get the weight. They didn't get hold your horses, right? So they think no means try harder. Now we are in instituting harm. So it has to be a real conversation. And I'll close this part by saying, people tell me, oh, you're you know, a body and sex positive pastor because you want to have sex. And I do. I want to have a lot of healthy, consensual, ethical, pleasurable sex. And I want to know, are you doing your breast exams? Are you getting your prostate checked? What's the weight doing? What's the skin doing? What's the pain you've been ignoring for six months saying to you, right? I want you to be well. So sexuality is a part of that, but it's not all of that. But because we've made it such a big proponent, it's been like this uh, 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 sexuality, right? Where it's like, integrate, baby. It's a part of you, not all of you. My brain wants to go back to uh, leveraging and flat out stealing the labor of Black women. Um, but we're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about sex, and I want to stay here. But, you know, I mean, I feel like it's, I feel like it's, Integrate, right? Yeah. So if we're talking about stealing the labor and the intellectual property of Black women, mm -hmm. right, and passing it off as Song of Solomon, it's like, how many other stories have been passed off or stolen? How many other ideas? How many women have been, you know, erased from the narrative who were there offering critical support, prayers, money, wow. housing, right? Wow. Yeah, and so to say that Women are supposed to serve the church until they meet their husband, which not every straight woman wants to get married in the first place. And there are not straight women who want to get married in the church. But that's another conversation. <laughs> that hurts. Um, that you serve God in this way, in a way that serves the church, but it's not in a way that serves you. Centering your pleasure says what feels good to me. And we were taught to believe that centering ourselves is selfish and it doesn't make you a good Christian woman. And I'm here to say that centering yourself heals yourself. And the healed you can show up in community and help us to heal as well. So, chat. Right. You got you got so, a clitoris for a reason. Right. So the shame <laughs> and the guilt are useless. Right? Absolutely useless. They keep you separated from yourself. Yep. They block you from And separated from God, which is sin. Which is, it keeps you separated from God, which is sin. And so it is, in fact, like an act of faith. Yes. To honor your desire. I say, amen. And honor what your I body is asking for. That's beautiful. Ooh, <laughs> <yo. laughs> these hard nose, these boundaries are about to enforce. Listen. Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> no is um, a holy word. No is a complete <laughs> sentence. I'm practicing. Say no, I'm practicing, you know, even alive this week. I was about to be like, oh, you know, I'm really tired. Like everything's just been so much. Like, can we be? I was like, I need to reschedule this live. Can you please offer this person Fridays? Like, I I don't owe you an explanation. And for many black women and families, we feel like we owe people. Like, we gotta explain ourselves. Like, no. Not oh, yeah, not necessary. Look at all of these lies and the harm mm -hmm. that they do. Um, I mean, and you get into a little bit about like the idea that um, these lies serve a purpose. It goes back to the the very beginning of the book, but it's a continuous thread. Who does this serve? Yeah. Who does this narrative serve? Yeah. Who does this framework serve? And I am reminded, um, and this is, feels like a, a cultural thing, like a Black culture thing mm -hmm. um, that might not be sort of well known in some mainstream US society, but the story about like, Ruth and Boaz. Yeah. Right? 
And like the ways in which the narrative around like, waiting for your Boaz oh, uh, shows up in, I would say, Black dating culture oh, absolutely. and <laughs> um, modern Black dating culture uh, feels, again, like a scam, <laughs> uh, and that the actual, like, when you, you know, maintain some fidelity to the words and what they actually mean, mm-hmm. that we have a whole other situation. <laughs> yes, we do, honey. The memes might, okay, so can we talk <laughs> about why accurate narratives, why yes. translations matter, and yeah. how we need to be rethinking um, the sort of Boaz narrative. Yes. Particularly black women talking to me and my friends on Instagram. Period. <laughs> no, so <laughs> chapter four is called, but the Bible says, acknowledging what church and society got wrong. Because I realized that when you're talking to black women, you were talking to women who are currently or formerly church. And have been quoting the King James version and you know just holding out for their poets. <laughs> so even when I say Boaz, it's a very particular concept. It's like the kinsman redeemer, the the protector and provider. First of all, Boaz was like eighty something years old. Okay, they don't tell you that he was wrinkly and ashy and probably smelled like mothballs. Right? Boaz was not Idris. Okay, and only you were okay or Jonathan Majors. You know. It was not giving. No. It was giving Joe Biden plus 10 years. <laughs> okay. And okay. Joe be looking about two calls away from going back to who he came from. So. <laughs> My God. Lord, when he be tripping going up the stairs at Air Force One, I'm like, somebody help Jesus. <laughs> Christians, particularly Black women, because our for, for many Black folks, their Christianity is their identity. So if I start to poke and prod, it's like, well, who am I? And so I get, I want to honor, right? This, this is hard to hear, but it's the truth. I just want to put that out there. So Ruth and Boaz uh, has been uh, shared as a story of like whimsical romance, right? And about the power of waiting and and asking for what you need and letting God provide. But the fact of the matter is when you look at the original Hebrew language, it has nothing to do with a woman going in and bowing at his feet and waiting for a blessing. The word that has been translated as foot, it was a euphemism for penis. So here we go again, not saying this word penis. We talk about God as if God has a penis, but when penis is actually in the Bible, we don't say penis. So, I don't know about your sexual lives, but when I think about bowing at a penis, I'm thinking about oral sex. Who gave Boaz head? And that is the part they don't want to tell us. And this is the thing. These black male pastors go to seminary and divinity school and they learn these truths and they do not share them. So I am holding them accountable and saying, don't be in my comment section. I'm like, yeah, we learned this in seminary. If every person, you know, every adult in your church does not know that. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that, you're like, okay, well, sex is in the Bible. And then we continue on with how, oh, she was given all of the food and the resources and the shelter that she needed. Head. From giving head, head, shoulders, <laughs> <Yeah, it's> like, <laughs> like, like, so to get your phone. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a tag in the comments, right? But if I can get you to believe that your Boaz is gonna come if you take care of the children and fry the chicken mm-hmm. and print the programs, and that just means I don't have to compensate you for your labor, and you are free labor. That's just enslavement. <laughs> So we, we and black women, we want to be a good woman of faith and we want God to bless us and we want our husband. If you're a straight person or you date men, you want your husband if you want to get married, right? So like even that is just a lot. It's just a lot because there are so many different expressions of romance and intimacy that weren't captured. Actually, that's a lie too. That weren't fully shared with us in the Bible. Like I'm thinking of Jonathan and David, right? Okay. I mean, ah! uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Talk, this, is, this is actually relative because Jonathan and David's relationship is the place in the Bible where we get language around soul ties. So for us who are told, if you have sex with a man who's not your husband, you are now connected to him forever in a soul tie. It was actually between two men in the Bible. So this love, you know, is like, oh, he loved him. Uh, I think Jonathan loved David like he never loved a woman. That was That's what the scripture says. So we can queer that, right? Yeah, now we have the same gender loving relationship. And now you got to deal with the fact that you've been teaching me about soul ties, but really it was about two gay men, but you don't want to talk about that. Sure. Or two queer men. They moved to Brandon Okay. So, yeah, I know. I know. I, I know. I know. Mind blown. Mind blown. <laughs> um, and so funny because there's a story about Abraham Lincoln um, writing about an aide uh, who he slept in the bed with. Um, an aid? An, an, an aid. person? No, no, it was a white Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Words mean things. Yeah, but um, in the biography, he talks about Abraham Lincoln and loving his aid uh, and his best friend and business partner um, in ways that he Oh, the aid is a man. Is a man. Holy shit! Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's something to say that. Like aid Lincoln. Right. And so, again, narratives that you know get reconstructed yeah. to serve particular aims and the yeah. harm that it does um but what's interesting about this is when you talk about um david and the story um that you t- it it invokes soul ties but it also invokes uh the word abomination mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. um well in the book mm-hmm. um you lay out like what the Bible clearly says are the abominations, yeah. and none of them have well, same sex. Not a one. <laughs> yeah. not a one. Included. So, like, really, they don't even discuss queer right. Right. as an abomination in the eyes of God. Right. Um, and so, not less about the history and how we got there, but what. So this black woman who's reading this book, she's mm-hmm. bought one for herself and loved ones and her beloved. Oh, girl, sorry. Right. <laughs> and, and her beloved. Um, and she is because these conversations are not just going to exist in the religious text. Like right. the things that we learn about sensuality and mm-hmm. sexuality come from family, society, yep. schools, mm-hmm. pop culture, yep. as well as our you know religious homes. For sure. And so this woman has bought this book. What tools like how do you want her to use the book how do you want her to use the text mm. how does she arm herself in conversations with beloveds we're not even going to talk about like the hostile people who don't yeah. want to yeah. but um, people who she's in community with yeah what is your highest ambition of how she would use such Ooh, things so good so there are a couple of ways that i envision folks using the book to really black women um, you can read it from cover to cover if that's your thing. I feel like I did a re- I did a really beautiful job around laying out like a historical, socio, you know, kind of cultural context. How do we get here? Um, going into then, um, what's the reality? What's the truth of our experiences? And then like dreaming of like what this new liberated self could look like in the world. So that's the arc. Um, I also believe that your intuition knows what you need. And so the same way we would, you know, open a book, uh, the Bible or Yama Van Zandt's book, and be like, what's this, you know, what date comes up? What scripture comes up? That's called bibliomancy, right? You can turn to a page and, be, and read it and it'll be, the message will be just for you. Um, at the last minute, we made a decision to go from hardcover to paperback. Um, and I'm really happy with that decision because one, I mean, it makes it more accessible to folks, but two, Black women be on the move. And they want something with them. And so I can see women taking this, you know, on their commute and just reading a page as a devotional. I can see you taking this to Ghana or Bali and reading it on retreat or with Black women, right? I can see that. Um, There is theory, there is praxis, and there are um, calls to act. I don't like that. That's so corporate. There (laughs) There are invitations, right, to experience it on your own terms. So I want Black women to read it and see themselves. I mean, from the author's note, when I say, hey, boo, I want you to know that this book is for you. And the fact of the matter is, even if you are not a Black woman or femme, you will still get something out of this. My entire editorial team, except for our Black woman co-editor, were white women. And they were like, this is the book I needed 10 years ago, 20 years ago. 
So the fact of the matter is when you center the healing of black women, others will be healed as well. And I will close by saying that men should be reading this book as well. If you date women, if you love women, because you're trying to be in relationship with us and we're coming with all of this baggage and you don't understand why we just had a great lovemaking session and we roll over and start crying because of shame, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know, deep cleansing breath. Everybody in here, exhale out. Back to your breath always. Okay. So yeah. So if you want to know why I felt I'm crying, read the book. And you be like, dang, you want to do Yes. <laughs> right? Before you even have the language. Before you have the language for it. Because you can't hear don't give head, girls, good girls don't give head, you know, all that jazz. Keep your legs closed. Keep your legs closed and you get engaged in or married and the light switches and you turn into a sexual goddess. It just doesn't work that way. So you gotta be honest. I remember how the church and someone bringing you a modesty cloth. Oh, God, black yeah. When I was serving as an assistant pastor in the Bay Area, I wasn't wearing stockings, but I would wear stockings. So apparently someone complained to the senior pastor that Pastor B is not wearing stockings. So I promptly went and what you said? I said cozy this one. Right. <laughs> so I promptly purchased some fishnets and we were going to go. Yes, you did. And I was like, are you happy now? And the tech director was like, I like them. <laughs> so I was like, you play with fire, you get burned. Like, we're not playing these games, friend. <laughs> so much. Um, you know, you want to take some questions? I would love to. Yeah, yeah from yeah. info, in house folks from online. Hi, y'all. You got questions for me? You know, all our folks in our Hi, Audrey. Congratulations. Thank again. you. Um, I feel like I've seen you through this like beautiful like journey of like, yeah. transformation. Um, like even think about like when you talked about like you were a cycle teacher and like I, I just I feel like you have been a, like just so inspiring to move in a way that is very um, honoring mm -hmm. of who you are and where mm -hmm. you know you're going. Yeah. And I say that because it has just always been such a big struggle of mine of like really owning when the transitions need to happen ah. <laughs> and being like, mm -hmm. nope, this doesn't serve me, walk away. Yeah. So I would love to get just some of your gems around how you've been able to completely close doors and Ooh, go on, child. how you've been able to <laughs> navigate such... Um, I know about a lot of the trauma that you've been mm -hmm. over with, um, like mm -hmm. the proverbial... Uh, when you talked about mm -hmm. some of the trauma, like how have you been able to move forward? Aw, I appreciate that, Audrey. Audrey had me on a spirituality for millennials panel. And like, <laughs> yeah, no, it means something when people see you and affirm you and like, we want your gift because everyone doesn't do that, right? And so I grew up in a household where school was the top priority, right? You're gonna go to school, you're gonna go to college, you're gonna get a good job. And I graduated from college without a job. And I was like, y'all lie. This whole thing is bullshit. I'm not doing this no more. So I literally would just feel into what do I want? Like, what excites me? And I realized that when I'm turned on, also, um, this is important, that in human design, which if you're not familiar, it's like a personality profile. You know how we have, like, what's the thing of myers for all that kind of that was like janky and corporate, like human design feels so full, you know? So um, I'm a generator, which means that my joy has to be activated for me to feel turned on. So I would say um, learn who you are in different profiles so that you can have language for like Enneagram and things like that, right? That's the cerebral part because black women are educated. We want, what's the book? What's the syllabus? What do I check out? So, I put my card. so let me give you something practical to, to do before I, before I say, turning inward like the fact of the matter is i heard you say you know of knowing when it's time to transition you knew you just didn't take the move to do it you were like okay my hand is on the doorknob i'm just closing okay three two one okay let me do it again okay <laughs> three two one okay no okay. okay so until okay. like somebody okay. just came okay. by probably you spirit one of your ancestors like just okay like you're done, you're done here. <laughs> um, so for me, it's been not re having this language, but realizing that I have been choosing myself intentionally. Um, and uh, we have an elder, um, Dr. Will Coleman, who says, choosing yourself is choosing God. 
and right. <laughs> And so I choose God in every situation. It's why I got a divorce. It's why I, you know, left the church. It's why I pack up and move just to see what happens. So start with something small. I ask myself every day, multiple times a day, LaVon, what would bring you joy right now? And to the extent that it's possible, I do that. So I would invite you to play around with that because once you're like, oh, okay, I can center myself in this. Let me center myself in that, you know? Is that helpful? Okay. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Tony. Hey, Tony. It's so lovely to be here. It's so funny that you mentioned um, Black women learning more about themselves at a kind of mental plane level. Like, I learned that I'm a projector in human design. Okay. That oh, really? That helped, oh, yeah. that helped me leave a job that was not serving me, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. Yeah. Um, learning more about my astrology, all of that. Mm -hmm. And I went on this journey inward, and what they don't talk about in the wellness and spiritual space is the shadows that come up mm -hmm. as you go deeper and deeper. Yeah. Like it gets ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It gets intense. <coughs> so I was very curious about, because I'm still actively in that space, you know, on your embodiment journey, did you face any shadows? Did you fight with the demons, you know, that are not out there, but inside right. that I feel like they come from trauma, mm -hmm. from our current lives, past lives, mm -hmm. ancestral lineage, yeah. all of it. I feel like I've been called to clear a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm just very curious what your journey has been with that and how you practice it every day. Yeah, thank you for your question. So this language is important, right, about ancestral, um, because many of us grew up talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And what about Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Hagar, right? <laughs> what about the other folks who are there? Um, and so why can we honor biblical ancestors but not honor the ancestors of what is literally coursing through our veins, right? It does not make sense. And so when you start talking about ancestral lineages, you realize I wasn't created in a vacuum, right? I got these cheekbones from somewhere. I got this hair texture, this complexion from somewhere. And so when I think about the stories that I've heard about my grandmothers and what they went through, when I think about my maternal grandmother, Norma Yvonne Osborne, who I dedicated the book to, um, and how she transitioned from breast cancer at 36. I'm like, what, right? I'm like, what was going on within her? What care wasn't she getting? What spiritual healing did she need that she didn't receive? And so I'm saying, I want to live a long and prosperous life. And Black women are often told, well, the way to do that is by serving God and being a good Christian. Da, da, da. <clears throat> I think integration is the key to living a long and prosperous life. Mm -hmm. So even when I hear you say that you're in your shadow period, congratulations, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you're in the cocoon and you know, the caterpillar has to turn into goo and eat itself and shit before it reforms <laughs> to a butterfly. And even then it's not just a butterfly until it has its wings, but you don't get your wings until you open the cocoon. That's how mm -hmm. a butterfly gets its strength, by beating its wings against the cocoon. And you can't open the cocoon for a person and expect the butterfly to fly. It's going to fall onto the floor because its wings aren't strong enough to fly. So the cocoon is broken open. So all that to say that they are not demons per se because even that externalizes it and others yourself from yourself. That too is a part of you. It's not your responsibility to you know uh, 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 try to make sense of it or understand why it happened, because that's what we do too, right? Like, how do I prevent this from happening again? <laughs> we don't go there. We say, this happened, it's my responsibility to heal it. And so saying, oh yeah, the part of myself that loves overspending, yup. <clears throat> the part of myself that do be getting jealous, yup, right? But yeah, I gotta look at the quick. <laughs> 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 Listen, I love being like, okay, here's my spending plan, but then I see a pair of shoes, I want Andy on clearance, and I always wanted this brand, okay, put it in the cart, like, it's happening, right? I deserve. I deserve, and I'm like, LaVon, you went over your spending plan, and you know what? I love you, girl. I love you for doing that. So when you can learn to love yourself for the shadowy bits, mm -hmm. just as much as you love the things that are in your Instagram bio, yeah. the things that are on your resume, <laughs> <laughs> okay? Because we don't put everything up in the Instagram bio, yeah, first of all, it's only but <laughs> um, all that to say that it's a part of the journey and in African language, it will be called initiation. It will be called getting that character together. It will be called you signed up for this for better or for worse. <laughs> 
So get you a belief <laughs> system and community and lean into it. Because in the words of Josh Odom, the only way through it is through it. So I like to say, I might have said this in the book, that I grieve for fun. <laughs> a lot of what comes up in shadow work is grief. Mm-hmm. Realizing that there is harm, trauma. Realizing that there is the brokenness of idealized dreams, right? Seeing things, people, systems for what they really are and being like oh shit like that's heartbreaking and I really feel like because we have a whole book in the bible called Lamentations that we're supposed to be spending a whole lot of time lamenting and so the suffering the pain that you feel that's a part that you have to give yourself permission to feel as well the suffering won't last this is a direct message to you now the suffering won't last always but if you keep repressing it that is the suffering the pain is not the suffering the grieving is not the suffering the Oh, I'm not gonna feel that. I'm not gonna feel. It. Let it go, and that's the release that you need. Okay. Correct. I Thank you. You're worthy, beloved. <laughs> and that was fair, but like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the way when the dark, scary part starts to introduce themselves to me, I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hop over that, I'm gonna right. skip over that, or like when the tears that are so well up and, and just the idea that it'll be there, it'll be there. until and that it is a part of you that yes. it's while these external events that it was actually happening to me that I processed these yeah. things and I have consequences that I must contend with. Yeah. Um and there's no one else to do it. No one <laughs> like I can't get somebody else to do it. Can't no, no, you can't no, have your sister your way up. It got your name on it. I, and not virtual assistant. No. <laughs> I heard that their yeah. English is getting so much fun. I'm screaming. <laughs> and that's the thing. As black women, we're the most educated demographic. We own the most number of businesses. So, like, you tell us to do something cheap, go, go. We, but when you tell us to sit down and that shit start coming up, you didn't give us tools, church, to sit with that. You try to clobber us with scripture and try to make us recite affirmations. Like, no, I need to express this rage. I need to express this grief. God gave us tear ducts for a reason. And then I'll close this part by saying, we've been sitting here talking about sensuality the whole time. And now we're talking about shadow work. If I talk about trauma, we're going to heal. But we all would have been, you know, snotting on the live. And it's like, <laughs> if we talk about pleasure, we're going to get to the pain point. Because you can only receive as much pleasure as you have received healing. But what's going to be more joyful and whole, holistic, like for the journey, is to say, okay, let me live my life in joy and pleasure, ease and flow. And when those moments come up, let me tend to them in the, in the moment or as soon, like as like, quickly after the moment as I can, because it's not going to last forever. Go ahead. I don't know that. We have two more questions and then we're going to run. Oh, three. Three more questions. Everybody got questions. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, online, you should have been here. I'm so happy. <laughs> I understand COVID still outside. I do. But thank you. <laughs> just you know if you dm me i put what i can offer is i can do a podcast episode about your question so if you have questions dm me on instagram i can send to that okay and we're back hi Ron. how are you i came late i'm magnificent how are you wonderful <laughs> thank you beloved i'm so happy for you uh as we're talking about um things that particularly straight male black pastors, mm-hmm. right, can do in order to offer support. What do you say or what do you offer to the queer black male community Ooh. to stand with, mm-hmm. to support, mm-hmm. um, to offer a shoulder, an ear, mm-hmm. um, just a space yeah. for black women? Oh, I love that. Thank you for that question. Um, And this is tender because you have been that for me. And (laughs) telling this for you in real time. I'm so grateful, and that is a release because of his brotherhood and his brothering, but also his mothering, because you don't have to be a woman to mother. And I think that's the beauty 
of honoring sensual faith when you are in your body is that whatever energy and expression of God and divine love is coming up in the moment, that's what that person needs. And so honestly, my real answer for you is to keep doing what you're doing because the fact of the matter is, is that our LGBTQ plus kin have been doing this work around bodies out of necessity, out of survival, right? 100%. Like, you know, house mothers and building community when church and family and society has rejected you because of who you are and who you love. Like, I look to queer folks to be like, what conversations are you having about your body? When it comes to self-love, I can look at a Black trans sister who, give, who gives looks and is super confident and be like, okay, if you can do it, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, I can do it. Absolutely. And so I think for loving Black women, giving us space to shift, developing relationships with us so that we can learn because Black women in the church have also been inundated with homophobia, queerphobia, and transphobia. Like that's a real part of it. And so in our healing process, we even have to look at the ways we have harmed or oppressed others in the community. So if you are in relationship with Black women, like offering us grace um, and also not making us do your, our work, not doing our work for us or trying to put our shit on you, but I think loving us, encouraging us to continue to liberate ourselves. Um, you know, if there are resources that have helped you as a straight Black woman, you know, who wants to marry a man, I can absolutely learn from the queer community about what it means to love yourself. Um, conversations around ethical non-monogamy like queer community has been doing that for ages which is not a conversation happening in the church so i'll close this part by saying that being yourself and building community in organic ways with black women and allowing us like how i just burst into tears right and I'm like, oh my god what's wrong like just, stop crying like no just let me be and you know you'll figure it out and feel let me feel yeah is that helpful yes Hi. Hi. Um, I'm an uncle. I'm a godfather. I am an ally. What age would you recommend this book is introduced to a young woman? That is such a loaded question. It's such a layered question that's less violent. Um, because the fact of the matter is a lot of Black women experience trauma around their bodies at a young age, even if we don't have the language for it. So we're learning stuff and ish about our bodies um, and it manifests when we're older. So I would say maybe not the text itself, but the concepts can be introduced, right? When you're with your babies, you know, I have a nephew who's gonna be too soon using the anatomically correct body parts for their names, right? You don't have a PP, <laughs> you have a penis, but you know, you urinate. I think just using that will help them to see that these words are normal and I can talk about them. So later on when it's like, mommy, there's a uh, hair on my penis. Like what's, you, okay, puberty, here we go. You know what I'm saying? Here we go. As opposed to like not knowing what's going on. Like I think of lots of black girls who their cycle <coughs> came on and they were like, I'm dying. What is going on by my bleeding? Just because we've had the conversation. So I think having age appropriate conversations about bodies is important. Um, teaching the babies about consent at a young age, right? It may seem simple, but boy, give your uncle a hug. I don't want to don't force children to hug people they don't want to hug. That teaches them that, oh, I have autonomy and I don't have to do anything I don't want to do around my body, which I think is really helpful. And then the last part is celebrating and affirming them, right? Just being like, I love your hair. I love your skin. I, you're the perfect height for your body. Like, you know, stuff like that. Like you said, your nephew was concerned about height. You're the perfect height for your body. And you go, like, whatever Ozzy is at. Like, you know, yeah, but exactly. But I guarantee you that in the moment when he needs to remember that he's a perfect high risk body, he's gonna hear your voice. You know? Is that helpful? Awesome. Hi, Hi. Speaking of sensuality, my curiosity is what are you feeling in your body? Oh, good. Deep gratitude. <laughs> Deep gratitude. Um the idea the feeling that like it was all worth it. Like my, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Like <laughs> child for all this joys and all this pains. I I know I'm the one to do this and no one else could have done it like me. Um and to see 
all of y'all from different parts of life is just like very full circle, whether it's like deep community, you know, we see each other off and on. We've been in community. We're just meeting. You just found out on Instagram. Like <laughs> it's the fact that I can speak my truth and all these different corners of, you know, my universe will come together. Um, I feel affirmed. I feel celebrated. I feel loved. I feel whole. I feel holy and good and sacred. <laughs> My curiosity though is, what are the sensations? Oh, oh, literally. Oh, okay. So I feel tingles in my hands. Um, I feel warmth in my like shoulders. Um, what else am I feeling? I mean, I'm feeling the breeze from the fan on my toes, but I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think those are the main things. Yes. You see how like she's like, no. How do you feel? Like, what's going on in your body? Not like how are you. Feeling, right? Yeah. It look, I am the whole facilitator of this journey and I am still digging in. Like, oh, literally, what am I feeling? I love it. You have the honor of giving our last question. Okay, thank you. Hi, Devon. I'm also so I'm an online supporter. I, I met you on Instagram. Yay. So I've never met you in person, but congratulations thank on your you. I'm super excited to be here and I listen to your podcast as well. Thank you. Break five stars. <laughs> I will. <laughs> 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 um, I have a question as you talked about your journey to um like ancestral mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. How did you get there? Because I'm a person <laughs> that grew up in the church, yeah. but never, mm -hmm. I never fully bought it. Mm -hmm. I was always like something just always seemed mm -hmm. not quite right. And I didn't know why, but I had to go to church because I lived in my mom's house. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but once I had a but once I moved out on my own and went to college, I really stopped going. Mm -hmm. And my mom, my family, they don't understand it, but they were just like, okay, that's just how she is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I also struggle with finding, like, I, I don't know something, but I still don't know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I feel like there's more out there. But yeah. when I started following you on Instagram, that, that ancestor veneration just really rings a bell with mm -hmm. me and feels true. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested more. Well, I want to affirm you first to say that's your ancestors talking to you. Mm -hmm. And again, like I mentioned earlier, we've been doing ancestral veneration in church. It was just more about the the biblical ancestors. We talk about Moses all the time. We talk about David's problematic ass all the time. We talk about <laughs> Jesus, right? Like they, it has been there. It just wasn't um, named ancestral veneration and particularly our ancestors. So I would say that there is a calling card in the spiritual realm for you and that there is a deep community of ancestors who want to be in relationship with you. And so um, have you started an altar? I'm getting a reason. Have you started an altar? I haven't. Okay. I haven't. So all you need is water and a candle. <laughs> water <laughs> is a portal. Um, it's a cleansing agent, a healing <clears throat> agent. Fire <clears throat> is a portal. And we can talk more about this. Um, actually, if you look at the proverbial experience, I want to say July 2020, I did a live with my pastor, Dr. Handy, about ancestral veneration. So go in the archives, because the archives are lit, okay? okay. <laughs> um, go in the archives and see that there. But I got there because once I started learning about African spirituality and how deeply communal we are, I realized that community is just not what I can see around me, that community includes my ancestors and that they're always walking with me. And I had to really release the idea that anything African was bad. Because I was, there was a point in my life when I was in the Pentecostal church where I would see an African mass and I'm like, oh, that's evil, that's demonic. I'm like, no, baby, that's you. Like, that's your people. And so I really had to remove internalized impression and say, no, my people are good in God and I am a descendant of my people. So let me do what feels good to us. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. It is. Thank you. My babe, my babe, listen, um, just as we are God's creations, our bodies are God's yes. creations, um, and they are gifts. Yes. This, your creation, sensual faith, I also very much see it as a gift for us all. I mean, you shout out Black women, and it's clear that it's written for Black women, mm -hmm. but in it is like a liberatory framework for all of us. Yes. And like, Y'all help me thank her. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I want to say thanks to all our folks watching at home. Y'all can click this teal button to buy Sensual Faith, the art of coming home to your body from Karis with some more. It really does help us when buy my folks from yes. So click that teal button. We're going to say goodnight to all of you. Stay safe and well. See you soon.